If this is your first time or two here again, I do want to remind you, uh, if you could, to stop by our connection table out here right before you go out the door on the left. Uh, make sure to pick up your gift if you did not receive that and also meet one of the pastors there waiting just to ask you or answer any questions that you may have. God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for the word today. Man, what an honor to be able to share Jesus today. What an honor to be able to speak to hearts and lives that are here today. God, we pray for those that are here in person. We pray for those that are watching online today, for them, Lord, to just experience a mighty move of God today. Lord, we ask that you would just do something special today in the hearts of each person that is here and draw each one of us nearer and closer to you, Lord, than we have ever been. In your name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. How many ever remember the kid in school that your parents wouldn't let you hang out with? Anybody? Anybody remember that? All right? And so, son, that boy is bad news, right? That girl's bad news. You need to stay away from them. Don't you know that when the two of you get together, you make some horrible decisions, right? Or how about this? If you try to date that girl, I'm going to lock you in your room till you're 18, right? So you are not allowed to ride with them ever again. Anybody ever hear that? All right, you're not allowed to ride with them. Or she is just a bad influence, stay away. Now, some of you were that bad influence. Now, you never planned to be a bad influence. It's just that things keep going wrong, right? Maybe your motives weren't the problem. Your judgment was just horrible. I call it your chooser being broke. You made uh, too many bad decisions. For some of you, it's not your past. It's your present. And you feel like that you're that person now. You're afraid you have a reputation. That everyone wants to stay away from you. Stay away from people like you. Maybe you've had a relationship go bad. When it started, you thought, man, this is perfect. This guy's going to make me very happy. Everything's going to go well. But it wasn't long before it went very bad. And then you immediately jumped into another relationship thinking, man, this is going to work out for me. This is going to be great. But before long, it didn't work out either. Your motives were good. You never planned to fail. But you made poor decisions. And everyone knows it. Your reputation is shot. And you're sure that people are talking about you. It feels like you have a target on your back. And you would do anything to be happy again. Students, maybe you've tried to be a good daughter. Or you've tried to be a good son. But you, you just keep messing up. It seems like no matter how hard you try, you just make bad choices. You've let your parents down, and you've let your friends down, and, and maybe both. And if you have to see one more person look at you with disappointment, you're just going to lose it. Maybe you've had more jobs than, than you can count. People have called you a lot, of, a lot of things like lazy and good for nothing and a dreamer without drive. With each job, you thought, man, this is my career. I'm going to make it, but, but it just doesn't seem to work out. Maybe you've tried to quit cold turkey more times than you can remember. You, you've been able to stay clean for a few months, but every time you just, you just seem to fall back. Everyone knows what you are. They know you're drunk. They know you're an addict. You're tired of, of trying, but you just seem to fail every time. And you're desperate to find happiness, and you're desperate to, to find meaning. Maybe it's something entirely different for you today. You've achieved a lot. You, you've met your, your goal, and you have a lot of nice stuff, but, but somehow it's never, never enough. It's never enough, and on the outside, everything looks great, and everybody assumes you're all wonderful and you're happy, but on the inside, you know that there's really still something missing, and you can't really find the happiness you're looking for. 
You've searched for many, many things and, 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 and many purposes, but, but, but you're ready to give up. And so the question today is, is there hope for the loser? Is, is there a chance for the, for the outcast? Can a bad influencer ever become a, a good influencer? For the person who is doing well but, but can't find fulfill, fulfillment, is, is there hope? Does God really have a plan and a purpose for your life? Well, we are studying Jesus' encounter with several different individuals. And today we look at a lifelong loser with multiple failures. Life was empty and she just couldn't seem to find fulfillment. She dreamed like everyone else of being married and having a happy family. But somewhere along the way, those dreams were shattered. She had been married five times and was living with another man. Her past was littered with debris of failed relationships, one right after another, and just endlessly being used by others. Life at this point was, was pointless for her. She was a reject. She was an outcast. The bad influence, the one everyone wanted to avoid. And one day she walked to the well for water. And she was lonely and she was all alone and there was really no hope. She was just going through the motions. But all of a sudden, in a moment, everything changed. All of a sudden, everything changed. At the point of no hope, Jesus entered her life. It's a compelling story found in John chapter 4. John chapter 4 verse 4 says, Now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. Now that word had is a very important part of this story. See, the direct route from Jerusalem to Galilee was, was through Samaria. But, Jesus, uh, but Jews refused to go that way because they didn't want to go through Samaria. Right? They didn't want to be around Samaritans. There was a deep distrust and dislike between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. When the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom of Judah, they took almost all of the population captive and exiled them to the Babylonian empire. But those left behind were the lower class people. The ones that nobody wanted to be around. They didn't want those kinds of people. And the ones, and then so all, you know, slowly other people begin to migrate in the area, and the Samaritans intermarried with them, and then emerged the ethnic and religious group, the Samaritans. The Samaritans' faith was a combination of commands of Moses and rituals and superstitions. And Jews despised Samaritans because they were religiously speaking half breeds. Jesus hated, our Jews hated the Samaritans. Their hate was so bad that if a Jew went through Samaria, he was not allowed in the temple for a week. He had to be cleansed after coming in contact with a Samaritan. So you didn't decide to go through Samaria. You didn't have to go through Samaria. You did everything you could to go around Samaria, right? It's like if you were in Valonia and you were wanting to go to BB, okay, uh, and to get there, you had to go through El Paso. But you didn't want to be around them El Pasoans. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and so you would do whatever you had to do to go around. If you had to go to Cabot and then go up, that's okay. It's better than being around them El Pasoans. Come on, right? We weren't going to be with them. Since that was the easiest route, that's what I said. But really for us, it would be like going to Clinton and not going through Greenbrier. Come on, somebody, right? Some of y'all may live in Greenbrier. I'll take that back. So I'm just teasing. But that's how the Jews felt about going through Samaria. But I want you to listen to me. Jesus had a purpose for his trip to Samaria. He was following a divine agenda. A divine agenda. Verse 5 says he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. 
And so the walk to Sychar was uphill all of the way, and it was hot, and it was dirty, and, and Jesus was thirsty, so he sat down by the well. And when a woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now the Samaritan woman was just going about her daily chores, doing what she always does every day, just like we do, getting up, get up for school, go to work. She was just going about her, her daily chores. But God knew exactly where she was going to be. He had a divine agenda for a life-changing meeting for her. Listen to me. It happens when you least expect it. You're just going through your day. You're just doing what you always do. Then all of a sudden you find yourself in the midst of a powerful God moment. Come on. Right? It can happen at any time. Divine appointments happen in the daily routine of life. It's one of the most awesome attributes of God. Come on, right? God is not limited to a specific place or a specific time. You, you don't have to necessarily be at church the only time you feel God. But at any moment, any place, in a normal routine of life, you can have a divine encounter with God. You can be vacuuming. Come on. You can be doing dishes. You can be taking the kids to school. You can be on the assembly line at work. Whatever it may be, right? See, some of you think you're here today by accident. You're here today because God wants you here. You're here today for a divine appointment because God has something special for you today. For some of you, this is your day. This is your day. This is the day you've been waiting on. Now, how do I know this woman was an outcast? Well, I have the privilege of reading the rest of the text, but there's also a clue in the passage. She was getting water at noon. You didn't get water at noon. That was the hardest part of the day. You got water in the morning, and you got water in the evening. But she was coming in the hottest, dustiest part of the day. I think this woman, whose name we never learned, came at a time when she could just be alone. Well, no one there was they were going to bother her or stub, snub their nose at her or, or stare at her. And, and when she walked up, no one was going to take their children to the side and say, Honey, we don't, we don't talk to people like that. See, everyone in town knew that what she was like. They, they knew what she had done. They knew her, her reputation. So what she did, she took the path of least resistance. And she came at a time when she could just be quiet and, and lonely. You see, but here's what I want you to know. Jesus knew all about her. Jesus knew all about her. He knew what she was. He knew what she had done. He knew she wasn't accepted in the community. Even though she was a loser and a reject and an outcast, listen to me, Jesus changed his itinerary to meet this woman. Jesus loves outcasts. Oh, you didn't hear me. I said, Jesus loves outcasts. Aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't just love the rich and the famous and the successful and the honest, but Jesus also loves the outcast? Regardless of how many times you've messed up. Regardless of how many times you've tried and you've failed, God loves you, right? Listen to me, when no one else cares, Jesus is there. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. She knew this was an unusual moment. She didn't talk to the Jews didn't talk to Samaritans, especially a Jewish man didn't talk to a Samaritan woman. But Jesus ignored the customary in order to show compassion. When Jesus saw the Samaritan woman alone at the well, he ignored the established, come on, tradition, and he established relationship. Listen to me, church. Jesus' priority has always been relationship. Not religion, it, it, it's, it's not going through motions, it's relationship with you. Jesus was, was not and Jesus is not prejudice. 
For God so loved the world that he sent his only son that, what? Whosoever believeth in him. That whosoever includes the Samaritans. The Jews, the Gentiles, the blacks, the Asians, the whites, the Hispanics, and every other race of people on this planet. Amen? Every soul matters to God. A true follower of Jesus, listen to me, cannot be prejudiced. Every time you act in prejudice, you are devaluing a soul whom Christ died for. We cannot disqualify anyone from Jesus' love, out of, uh, uh, his love or our love, because of their race, or their skin color, or their background, or their economic status, or their social status, right? We must extend the same love and compassion that Jesus did. Amen. You know, we talk a lot about prejudice, but there are some of you in this room, you've been on the receiving side of prejudice. You've been the one left out. You've been the one made fun of. You, you found yourself hiding, come on, like the Samaritan. Well, I've got good news for you. Jesus meets you right where you're at. Isn't that awesome? Jesus meets you right where you're at. Jesus didn't send the disciples and say, y'all go change this woman, then I'll meet her. No, Jesus meets you right where you're at. And we want to meet you right where you're at. Jesus defied all prejudice in order to reach this woman. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus answered her, if, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gives us the well and drank from it himself and, and did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? So her, her answer was really a little sarcastic. Let's just be real here. Yeah. Well, I don't know how you're going to get a drink. You're welcome to, but you don't got nothing to get water with. And are you greater than Jacob? Right? She completely missed it. She was talking about natural water, but Jesus was talking about something entirely different. She, since she didn't get it, Jesus said, well, I'm just going to reveal the truth to her, right? Jesus is the living water who satisfies completely. When you meet Jesus, I'm going to listen to, listen to me, everything changes. You can't really meet Jesus and stay the same. you going to change. Now look at his answer. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whosoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will be, become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. This woman said to him, sir, well I can just see her. Think about her situation. Think about her situation and all the reject." And she's saying, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. See, now she understood. He was talking about living water. He was talking about eternity. This woman had lived an incredible hard life, and now she saw a glimpse of hope. A glimpse of, of change. A, a, a glimpse of hope in this dreary life that, that she lived. She was reaching out, grasping for anything to feel the desperate longing in her soul. Maybe you're here today and you're, you're, just, you're just longing for acceptance. You long for significance. You long for happiness. And fulfillment, you tried to find it in a lot of things. You tried to find it in relationships, or alcohol, or drugs, or your possessions, or your career, maybe in sports, in money, nothing. 
Nothing seems to really satisfy. There's still something missing. You, you, you got to have a little bit more. You got to do a little bit more. You got to be a little bit more successful. You, you, you got to have another drink. You got to have another fix. You just, you just can't find satisfaction. Can I tell you, only Jesus, only Jesus can feel that thirst of life. That longing in your soul. All who are thirsty and all who are weak come to the fountain, dip your heart in the stream of life, let the pain end. Let it be washed away in the waves of his mercy as the deep cries out to
Hallelujah. Let's pray before we continue. Father, I just, I pray as we move forward today, you just prepare our hearts. Lord, there's we're some that are here today that are, that are stuck in a way of life, and they, and they need to be set free. There's some, Lord, they're in the same situation this woman was in. Lord, they need a fulfillment. They need to feel the presence of God. They need, to, they need to be filled with the presence of God. There's some, Lord, today that, you know, they, they've been coming to church a long time, but they're just empty today, and they need a fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, prepare us to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name. Verse 16, it says, He told her, go call your husband and come back. You see, this wasn't a strange request. By having this extended conversation, Jesus was kind of pushing the boundaries because if he was going to talk with the woman at this link, you would have her husband there. Verse 17, she says, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. And I love verse 19, because she says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. You see, even though you may not approve of her actions, you have to give her credit here. She didn't try to lie. She just admitted it. She, she faced the past. She didn't try to argue with Jesus. She didn't come up with a bunch of excuses. Her past was a fact, and, and you couldn't change it. You see, many people assume that she was just sexually immoral or unfaithful. But in reality, divorce was very rare. And we don't know how many of them ended in divorce or or from a, a dead spouse. But we do know this, a woman could not initiate divorce. It was from a man. So she didn't dwell on her past. She just... Uh, or Jesus didn't dwell on her past. He just let her know that he was aware of her condition... And then he continued, listen to me, to show her hope and care. If you feel like an outcast, worthless, or hopeless, this is an important lesson for you. Jesus knows your past and loves you anyway. Your past is not a surprise to Jesus. Right? He knows what you've done. He knows where you're at. He loves you in spite of that. Jesus, who didn't know this woman, knew everything about her. She said, I see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. You see, this was an ongoing theological debate between the Samaritans and the Jews. It was a a big uh, disagreement. But by his answer, it's obvious Jesus did not intend to to follow in this debate. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and truth. And the woman said, now I know the the Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Now, see, she still had hope. Now, it was a distant hope. She had already lost hope in this world, but, but she had read enough of the Old Testament that she knew there was hope coming, right? She knew that on that day her hurts would be healed and all of her emptiness would be fulfilled. And then, verse 26 says, Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am He. I love this. Jesus revealed to a Samaritan, listen to me, with the disgraceful past that he was the Messiah. What a moment it must have been for this woman. Jesus announced he's what she's been looking for. 
what she had been waiting on. Listen, when people have let you down, when there is nowhere to turn, when you're ready to give up on life, when happiness can't be found, Jesus is there. There's Jesus. Jesus is, I want you to listen to me. Jesus is not one of many answers. Jesus is not an answer. Jesus is the answer. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asks, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? You see, his disciples walked up and found Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. And the disciples, they weren't, they weren't happy to be in Samaria to begin with. And now Jesus is talking to another woman. And they just treated her like a piece of furniture. We don't see where they acknowledged her at all. They, they missed the moment and the point. Now jump ahead with me a few verses. And as soon as the woman left, the disciples offered Jesus food. And then Jesus, Jesus said, I don't need your food. Now in verse 30, 35, I don't know if Jesus got frustrated, but I kind of feel like he did here. What, what do you think? I think he got a little frustrated. He said, do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes, guys. Look around. See the field? It's ripe. It's harvest. It's ready. You're following me because you say you want to do good. You want to do ministry. But open your eyes. You guys just missed an opportunity to minister to somebody. Right? He's saying the Samaritans are ripe for harvest. They're ready. My plan even includes the Samaritans. All around you. <laughs> Listen. People are hurting. Who need Jesus. He may be the, the guy that you normally would ignore. She may be the person you, you normally wouldn't talk to. But can I tell you, they're ready to meet Jesus. And you might be just missing a divine appointment. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could, could, could this be him? Could this be the Christ? You see, people avoided her. They knew her past. They knew the truth. Now she went right up to them and said, you got to come and meet a man who told me everything that I've ever done. Come on. You've got to come and see him. You see, all the hurt and all the rejection and all the failure didn't matter anymore. Come on. She had to tell somebody what Jesus did. Amen. Let me ask you, what, what, what is in your past? What mistake? have you made? How many failures do you have behind you that you want to erase? Can I tell you Jesus will do better than that? He'll turn your past into your testimony. He'll turn your past into your testimony. He will use your past to reach others. What is your past? Do you struggle with alcohol? Or drugs, addiction. You see, God can turn that around and make it a story that you can use to reach others for Jesus. Have you had a lot of failed relationships? And now you know Jesus. I'm telling you something. Jesus can take that unique situation you've been in and use it to minister people in unique ways. Were you a bitter, angry, hot tempered? Critic? Well, share your story how Jesus turned you around and made you an encourager. Amen? Amen. Were you a painfully shy introvert that was picked on and rejected? Share your story how Jesus has led you to your purpose. Amen? Listen, we don't celebrate the past, 
but we use it to point others to Jesus and how he can change their future. Amen. You see, this room is full of ex-somethings. We're all ex-somethings. We all have a past. We all have had failures, right? We are perfect and we don't pretend to be, right? But we're forgiven and changed by the blood of Jesus. Verse 30 says, they came out of the town and made the way toward him. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from the town believed on him because of this woman's what? Testimony. He told me everything I ever did. The Samaritans believed because of her testimony. The, the very people who wouldn't even talk to her now followed her to meet Jesus. Come on. What an amazing story. Because of this one sinful woman with a disgraceful past who met Jesus and then shared what Jesus did. So she brought revival to the whole community. Feel like an outcast, a misfit, or a loser? Are you afraid of your past or maybe even your present? That it disqualifies you from serving God? Can I tell you that's a lie from Satan? We see it over and over in the Bible. Jesus turns outcast into evangelist. Does he not? Do you, do you know the people who are most passionate about sharing Jesus? It's the ones who've experienced His grace and forgiveness. Come on, share what Jesus has done for you, right? Verse 40, so when the Samaritan came to him, Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his word, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Amen? Now look at that. People are talking to this reject now. Come on. When she met Jesus, her life changed. She was no longer just a survivor. Come on. Now she had a purpose, and that purpose was to point others to Jesus. God's plan for your life is the same plan he had for her. He wants to deliver you, and then he wants you to share with others what Jesus did for you. Amen? A personal encounter with Jesus. When you have that, you're supposed to share and influence others. Amen? So as we get ready to close, I want you to listen to me. Regardless of your past, regardless of your past, regardless of the obstacles stacked against you, Jesus is just available for you as he was a Samaritan woman. I want to point you to Jesus this morning. I want to point you to Jesus who fills the empty hearts. I want to point you to Jesus who is the living water. I want to point you to Jesus who can take the place of all those broken relationships of those empty careers. I want to point you to Jesus who can take the place of the drugs and the alcohol and the sex. I want to point you to Jesus who can take the place of your failures. Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. So I want to pray for you today. If you feel disqualified because of your past, I want to pray for you. If you feel disqualified because of your present, I want to pray for you. If from the outside, everything looks good and people think you're great, but, but inside you're just, you're not happy. You still feel empty. 
Or maybe you're here today and you say, you know, I don't really know much about what you're talking about, but I just know I need this Jesus you're talking about. I need Jesus. If you haven't been using your past to share Jesus, I want to pray with you. And if your present needs to become your past, I want to pray for you. So as they begin to sing this song and you stand to your feet, If you need your present to become your past, I want you to get out of your seat right now and come to the front. Come on. You need the present life you're living in to become a past, and it's no longer your life. Come on. Don't let the enemy keep you away. If you're honest, you say, the way I'm living right now is it right, and I need it to be my past, and I want to come to Jesus. If that's you, make your way to the front. And if your heart if you're here today and, and you say, I just, I just, I don't feel like I'm qualified. I don't think I can make a difference for Jesus. Jesus wants to touch you this morning. That's you. I want you to come to the front. If you're here this morning and you say, I got a pass, but I hadn't been sharing, I hadn't been sharing with others what Jesus has done for me. If that's you, I want you to come to the front. Come on, as I sing, if you need prayer for any reason, I want you to